But I prefer a man who lives and gives expensive jewels. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with a glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Someone of unsurpassed literary ability wrote this quote from the Song of Songs, a book of the Hebrew Bible, 900 years before the Christ event. Other evidence that jewelry and love were associated in the ancient world is found in the House of Veti, excavated at Pompeii from September 1894 to January 1896. Archaeologists assume the house, which was a luxurious residence, may have been looted shortly following the eruption of 79 AD because two signet rings were found outside its front door. They may have belonged to its owners, who were freed men, pursuing power and status in the mobile society of the first century Roman world. On the house's walls, a detailed fresco depicts a goldsmith's workshop, in which a group of Amarini, or Cupids, whose very name means desire, are engaged in making jewelled ornaments, intended to wound their victim's heart. Jewellers had a ready market at Pompeii, where the elite in Roman society went for a holiday and to enjoy the company of friends. The level of business for jewellers was such that even very special gem cutters and engravers from Rome were drawn to make a living there. Emeralds were popular because they were found in nature, and there is a story that the Roman Emperor Nero used a large emerald to shade his eyes from the glare of the sun ancient society's idea of the perfect sunglasses. The jewellery girl was a Roman lady whose image was found on a mummy portrait painting at Hawara in Egypt. On the top of her bun is a pin set with pearls and garnets. The bun is gathered with a gold chain with a central medallion and decorated gold boxes at either side. Above these, a long pin is worn across the back of her head. She has four necklaces, the uppermost matching the pin in the bun with pale stones, perhaps aquamarine, in gold settings between small pearls and garnets. Beneath is a necklace of squared emeralds, separated by golden beads, and below that is a chain of gold beads with a gold pendant. Hanging low on her breast is a plated gold chain with a large oval stone, perhaps an emerald intaglio, in a heavy gold setting. She is also wearing the most popular style of trident earrings, with a central pearl set above the bar and three pendant pearls. Pearls were highly prized and the most valuable were usually imported from the Red Sea and could fetch quite exorbitant prices. The cameo technique thrived at Pompeii. Cameos were made of different materials such as rock crystal, sardonyx and agate. The more modest were made of glass and were very popular. Subjects range from portraits to portrayals of deities and mythological stories. One of the most famous depicts the family of Emperor Augustus. Down the centuries, Cupid became an icon, shooting his bow to inspire romantic love. He eventually became the personification of love and courtship in general. In the fashionable world of 19th century England, young ladies of the classical school of ornament wore cameos. In 1859, an article appeared in England's popular magazine Punch, a satirical sketch it has an amusing extract that makes the point on how hard it was to wear the jewellery inspired by the archaeological remains of ancient Roman culture. My dearest Maud, you know the randoms have just returned from their long residence on the continent. 
I spent a day last week with Imogen Random, who kindly showed me her jewel casket. The only drawback to her classical arrangements is her small and diminutive stature. The weight of her gladiator's necklace is positively distressing to the collarbones. Her hair is visibly diminished since she took to wearing Greek daggers and Roman pins, both of which are so pretty and so antique. And her poor little ears, well they suffer martyrdom with the weight of her earrings, exquisite flying figures of victory, which are supposed to be constantly whispering joyful tidings of new conquests. Employ every art with your papa, Maud, to induce him to bring you to the Eternal City, where we may have the inexpressible happiness of shopping at Castellani. During the last 50 years of the 19th century, on the basis of a mounting interest in archaeology, any lady of fashion visiting Italy would consider her tour of Rome totally incomplete if she did not call into Castellani's shop near the Spanish Steps. There she could acquire one of the famous pieces of Italian archaeological revival jewellery that he offered. Fortunato Pio Castellani, 1794 to 1865, pioneered the classical revival in jewellery. He trained many goldsmiths who produced outstanding works, none more brilliant than that of Carlo Giuliano, his pupil who opened a workshop at London in 1860, producing exquisite jewels that were an allegory of love. Gorham, talk to me, Harry Winston, tell me all about it. By the 1920s, an androgynous yet sexy woman enjoyed avant-garde jewellery. The ideal jewel complemented a particular dress or a particular woman. Mrs. Wallace Simpson, later Duchess of Windsor, was an enthusiast of the prevailing steel modern. The stunning jewellery fashioned for her by Van Cleef and Arpels, Belperon, Harry Winston and Cartier, and given to her in love by her prince, king or was it a duke, inscribed, My Wallace, from her David, said it all. What more could any woman want than a man who'd give up being a king for love? When people today talk about jewels, jewellery, gemology and gems, it is clear the vocabulary has become confused. Gemstones are treasured minerals found in the earth. Gems are the objects fashioned from them. Jewels are gems ready for mounting into jewellery and other objets d'art. And jewellery? Well, it's the finished product that if its designer from Cupid to Cartier has succeeded, adorns its wearer well.